These audio adventures are supported by writers, narrators, and listeners like you. Without your help, these stories can't be produced. If these stories feed your imagination, please consider helping me, Joshua David Ling, feed my family by visiting joshuadavidling.com support and becoming a monthly contributor. Or you can tip me on Cash App, dollar sign Joshua David Ling. If you'd like to have your audiobook or audio play feature here on Audio Adventures, get in contact with me at joshuadavidling.com. Today's episode is sponsored by the following. Christians who are artists, artisans, and creators are a unique unit in the war on culture. They're often over and underestimated at the same time. What does it take to be an artist, and what does it take to win the culture war? Join Joshua David Ling as he rallies the troops to answer these questions and promote the best artists for God's glory. We're in this war together. Join us at the front at joshuadavidling.com slash poets at war. Four unique individuals with unique abilities. A weather controller, an illusionist, a knight, and a power copier unite to protect the Jewel of the South, Atlanta, Georgia. This is Guardians of Atlanta. And now, Guardians of Atlanta, Episode 2, Crusader, the White Knight. 1. The Hymn of the Knights of Adonai So far in this tale we've followed Cirrus and the losses that she survived, of slowly losing her small-town home and then losing her boyfriend's life. That tale will continue as we progress, but for now another tale comes in view. Follow along, and all will make sense. Trust the story I'm about to tell you. It begins with a hymn written many years ago when an organization arrived upon the shores of North America through toil, wind, and strife. This hymn is written as a teaching tool for those who would join the company of the parachurch group, the Knights of Adonai. Listen closely, and you'll see. See the Knights of Adonai, from Britain's shores they come, to the new land America, to seek and serve the sun. Their garments shining brightly, their hallelujah sing, to one and one alone, their God Jehovah King. Lord, the knights of Adonai, who long ago did fight and sought to serve the Lord with honor, strength, and might. Their Lord has given heritage o'er all the world abroad. Through his story the night sang praises unto God. Bless the knights of Adonai who claim the wayward souls, who train up Lord and Lady, who shield from storm and cold. Bless them all thrice times over, Jehovah El Shaddai. Give souls for good labor to the knights of Adonai. Strengthen the knights of Adonai so that they may protect the saints who live abroad and those within their nest. Give them valor in battle and give them skill with sword. Both physical and spiritual, both steel and God's great word. 
Humble the knights of Adonai, do not let them be vain. Let their one and only boast be in the one who came. In their Savior Jesus Christ, who's at the Father's side. Make lowly knights of Adonai exalt the church, his bride. Keep the knights of Adonai, protect them in their path. Defend them from their enemies, crush evil in your wrath. Their refuge and strong tower, when fire surrounds all. Guard your guardians, Adonai, guard them, Lord of all. Love the knights of Adonai, forgive them for their sins. Hold the knights of Adonai, to heaven bring them in. Let them sing praise forever as you reciprocate the rare unspeakable love that only you create. 2. Refugees to the New World On a cold, rainy night in a tiny Atlantan town, a middle-aged British man gripped his coat and looked down. He was walking to the place where anyone may go, a place that's dry and warm when you're tired and slow. T'was a cold winter's night, and the wind blew at him hard, but he clung to the package for which he stood guard. Wrapped in his coat, he approached the large church. He rapped on the door and stood on the stairs, perched. The massive door opened, welcoming the man in, and he took a second to collect himself from the cold winter wind. The man who opened the door spoke first. The brethren told me you were coming, but what is this cargo you have that they say is so stunning? The man who came in opened his coat and produced a tiny infant shaking from the cold winter's abuse. William, said the man who was shaking from the cold. William is the babe's name, and he is worth more than gold. The man from the church took the baby in his arms and wrapped him in blankets to keep him snug and warm. Fenris, the churchman said, from where did he come? From a place cold and numb, from the streets of London. His mother, Fenris started to recount the tale, was a friend of our church, a strong woman, yet frail. She feared for her life, and gave him to me. She said to take him to the land of the free, to the knights here in Atlanta, to the men who stand high. She told me to raise him as a knight of Adonai. The churchman nodded and tended to Fenris and William. 3. The Rearing of William Avery The rearing of William Avery was the best that it could be. From the age of three he learned to sing in four-part harmony. At five he learned to fence, and soon he learned to read and write, but the Bible was his one true joy in morning and at night. When William was eight, he was great at wrestling large and small. His rival Brock, whose heart and stock was admired by the knights all. Fifty-fifty, Brock and William, every fight would go. Neither wanted to be the one to take the final blow. Oh, the rearing of William Avery with fire in his bones. His friends, they loved him endlessly. He'd never be alone. His Savior loved him even more and taught him every day to love his fellow knight and neighbor and always to obey. When William turned ten, he got Calvin, the name of his very first sword. A short sword it was, but named after a man who loved the Lord's word. Will treasured his sacred tool and learned to protect and fight. And he never was without Calvin in morning or at night. 
The knights encouraged William in the way to stand up tall, every Sunday singing hymns to Christ the Lord of all. Be thou my vision, come thou found in the old 100th Psalm. William Avery sang to God, and with heart he waved a palm. Oh, the rearing of William Avery with fire in his bones. His friends, they loved him endlessly. He'd never be alone. His Savior loved him even more and taught him every day to love his fellow knight and neighbor and always to obey. Sixteen years the boy had lived and Calvin grew too small. So at a party with his friends, his master engaged them all. The time has come, Fenris said, for William to obtain a new long sword, shiny and new, and Knox is the sword's name. At eighteen years, William had his first fight in the city. A man attacked a woman, and he would not give her pity. Will disarmed the violent man of the knife which he had held, and with one hold of crippling power the violent man was quelled. Oh, the rearing of William Avery with fire in his bones. His friends, they loved him endlessly. He'd never be alone. His Savior loved him even more and taught him every day to love his fellow knight and neighbor and always to obey. At twenty-one, William had his training fully complete. The knights gathered together to see William gain a seat. Among the masters, now he was a young and bold-hearted knight. But Malachi Dodd, their leader, had one more surprise in sight. When knights from their craft graduate, they receive a present, a weapon of speciality to suit their personal talent. Malachi gave Will a great sword, fifty inches in length. William named it Cromwell and thanked God for its strength. Oh, the rearing of William Avery with fire in his bones. His friends, they loved him endlessly. He'd never be alone. His Savior loved him even more and taught him every day to love his fellow knight and neighbor and always to obey. 4. Duel By the 25th year of William's life, a tradition had begun. Among the knights trained for combat, a prize was to be won. At the summer solstice celebration, the two best warriors were picked to duel the other one-on-one -on -one in a special armed conflict. The Fellowship Hall of Aletheia Church was large and made out of stone. In the central area, a space was cleared where the battle was to be shown. The guardrails were put up and chairs were set for spectators to sit in, and the banners were hung all around the hall waving proudly for summer to begin. Safety was taken in the way that most would readily assume. Padded armor and blunted weapons to protect the fighters from doom. And while the knights did not allow a single wager to be placed, the knights and dames would cheer their favorite with spirit and with haste. The rules were simple, three rounds scored by landed strikes and advances. Parries, blocks, and a few other things scored points to help their chances. But one critical hit could win a match, the throat, the heart, or head. And both Brock and William were looking to score one in the match that was up ahead. The other thing about the match that made it most unique was that William and Brock used weapons built for power and physique. On one side, William with his 50-inch greatsword, a Cromwell by name it was known. On the other was Brock with his battle-axe Gideon, with power to crush elephant's bones. As the two combatants stretched and prayed in the circle battle zone, their teachers, masters, Fenris and Dodd, spoke in a corner alone. William is great, Master Dodd spoke. His instincts know no bounds. But Brock is a specimen beyond any knight, and in the end, it will be him who is crowned. We will see, Malachi. Brock is stalwart, but William has something apart. What Brock has in spades in size and strength... William possesses in heart. And just then the crowds came into the hall, cheering and shouting to them, that would soon be focused in tunnel vision not reachable by normal men. The first round was signaled by the bleat of a horn, and then the fighting commenced, both men attempting to score a quick win and then both jumping back on defense. They circled one another, mirror images of each other, until William attacked. But Brock sidestepped and wrapped the handle of his axe around William's neck. William stepped around Brock's left leg and tripped Brock to the floor. But William's advantage didn't last long as Brock evened the score. 
Brock whirled the pin completely around and sat atop Sir Will. But William swung with all his might and nearly won the kill. Brock pushed up and off of Will as soon as he saw the swing. He backed away and circled round as the air began to ring. Let's go, Will! The crowd would shout and clap five times in a row. Let's go, Brock! The others would chant, shout, and clap in tow. Back and forth the first round went until the signal horn blew. Then William and Brock went to their corners to rest and let aggression stew. The second round started, much as the first, with neither man advancing far. But soon Brock crushed William's left shoulder with what felt like a speeding car. Five points to Brock was the first official score, soon followed by ten and fifteen. William tried blocking as best as he could, but Brock simply crushed that scheme. Fifteen more points and the round ended suddenly with William writhing in pain. The official asked Will if he could go on, and William said, I can. A few moments later, round three began with William bruised and sore, and Brock tired from swinging his axe, but both with a lot more in store. Brock charged William, and William charged too, but at the last second, he rolled. And the bulk of William's body collided with Brock's knees, then William stood brave and bold. Brock screamed in pain and held his knee as William brought Cromwell down, and the blunt sword point hit Brock in the chest, and soon after, it was William that was crowned. I told you that William would win this fight. His heart cannot be matched. Brock is a talented warrior, no doubt, but tonight he was simply outclassed. Malachi Dodd smiled with a nod as nurses tended the men, who had just proved that no matter the size, any fighter can still win. 5. The Meeting After the celebration of the coming season, the knights all gathered for another reason. As chatter among them began to slow to a halt, every eye turned to Malachi Dodd. Standing behind a podium in the Fellowship Hall, he was a presence to be seen so slender and tall. Narrow bird-like features, such as long ears and nose, Malachi Dodd stood to propose. He wore a dark green cloak around his slim form, and his brown eyes pierced the crowd as flesh is by thorns. This is a proud moment for the Knights of Adonai. We've been successful in our missions and lifting God on high. But now I propose to you a mission in a dangerous zone, to protect and secure Georgia's mountain made of stone. You see, a number of men have approached me, and they've told me of Stone Mountain's great emergency. It seems as though a gas leak has left the entire park closed to the public, and completely in the dark. What I propose is that we aid them with security, the Knights of Adonai aiding them through this time of unsurety. We'd receive no compensation, this would be charity, and we'd help the whole community by assisting for free. Before we put it to a vote, from the elders of this society, are there any questions, any lingering anxiety? Immediately Master Fenris arose from his chair. He stood proudly but respectfully against what Dodd had to share. Unfortunately, Malachi, I still do not see what the point of being guards at Stone Mountain would be. The knights are soldiers in God's holy horde. I do not see how this plan serves the Lord. We'd receive no compensation with which to aid orphans and widows, and our efforts would be laid out very thin across a large estate. The good is outweighed by the losses we'd take. I see not wisdom nor good stewardship. Our goals are not served by shooting from the hip. There was a murmur among the crowd as Fenris finished his thought, but calm was personified by Malachi Dodd. It seemed none of the elders among the Knights of Adonai had any more questions or lingering anxiety. So Malachi Dodd sought to answer Fenris, and lay the matter very quickly to rest. Quentin, what else are the Knights to be? We do not fight dragons or wars in this city. The community is who we are to serve the most, and I hear Stone Mountain is in need of our post. 
so if there are no more objections, let's hear what it's to be. The votes were then cast, and the knights all agreed. Stone Mountain would be helped, despite Quinton's appeal. And the contract was finished, with Malachi's seal. 6. Master and Student Following the meeting, great fellowship was had. All around the church's campus, knights and dames made glad. Some would discuss theology, others would dance and sing, still more would enjoy the feast and food as joyfulness did ring. In one corner off to the side, William engaged his master, on his reasonings against what Master Dodd eagerly sought after. Why did you oppose helping Stone Mountain Park this time? I really couldn't follow your logic. The stars did not align. Master Dodd has become very liberal in the battles we choose to fight. Stone Mountain has the state's resources. Why do they need our knights? He is so sincerely ready to help. I wonder if he will lead us right off a cliff to help those below. I see your point indeed. Well, it appears that nonetheless, we're going to go and help. What would you suggest we do? Keep our worries to ourselves. There's no sense in going against what the elders did decide. It's not against God's moral law, and so we must abide. Just keep your eyes peeled for anything strange, and do the job you know best. William nodded and bowed to his master, holding his fist to his chest. 7. Secrets at Stone Mountain On the first day of patrol around the Mountain of Stone, William stood at his post, all alone. It was a bright and sunny day, and birds chirped their songs, but somehow, William knew something was wrong. He paced back and forth in front of the train tracks, with an old steam engine behind him at his strong back. The humid Georgia air beat down on his brow, but soon came Master Dodd with water and a towel. It takes a dedicated man to wear his uniform in weather this hot, humid, and warm, but no knight of mine is without some aid. Come. Let us stand over in the shade. The master and his knight walked over beneath an old oak, and when William had quenched his thirst, Master Dodd spoke. I know that Master Fenris means well, but I hope there are no hard feelings to tell. I simply wish to help however I can. You understand, William? You understand, William? Do you agree with this plan? William looked off down the path which he came, and contemplated his response. I have no shame. What we're doing serves purpose. Of that there is no doubt. But I think Master Fenris's appeal was about the fact that our purpose is only to serve God. That is my only qualm with this mission. Master Dodd nodded and slowly replied, That's all very important, William. But besides serving the community, how do we serve God? I'm sorry to say, but Master Fenris's logic is flawed. I do not understand everything, that much I admit. But in what we do for God, there has to be a limit. Not a limit. That's not the right word. What I mean is that God doesn't rely on our own planning schemes. We have orders and we carry them out. I hope you know what I'm talking about. Master Dodd smiled and looked at the ground. Yes, you've great wisdom, Will. That much I've found. You'd be a great asset to my grander plan. Dodd stood up and offered William his hand. William sat puzzled at this curious phrase, and the two stood there in time, stuck in that gaze. What did you say? William wondered aloud, taking a moment to wipe sweat from his brow. My grander plan, Master Dodd repeated. There are many ways in Atlanta that the knights are needed. If we do not act soon, this opportunity will cease, and if we act now, we will bring about peace. William stood up at the mention of peace. Peace at what cost? Answer this at least. What are your plans, Master Malachi Dodd, and how much do they differ from the word of God? William approached Dodd with fervor in his pace, and from many yards off, Brock saw William's face. He read it as anger and ran up to see what this confrontation was about to be. William was too close for Brock's personal pleasing, so Brock shoved him away, and his anger began seething. What is wrong with you? asked Brock with a grunt. You better explain yourself for that little stunt. Then came Master Fenris from around the bend. That's enough, Brock. Stand down. Make this all end. Now, William, what is the problem? Master Dodd says he has plans. He tried to enlist me. This whole thing's a scam. Is this true, Dodd? 
Back off! Brock shouted and grabbed at his axe. Watch out! Their blades met with a clash. While Master Fenris pled that they should stop, a third blade reared its head from Malachi Dodd. That knife took a plunge into Master Fenris's back, and in another moment, William's vision went black. 8. Interlude When Philip Keller was just a boy Philip Keller tried to stay quiet, even though he was awake. His mother dozed in the front seat, her hand on the emergency brake. The sun in Toronto gleamed through the windows, making it warmer than the night before, and their station wagon heated quickly. He was thankful for that and more. He had hoped that his mom would remember the promise she had made to him, but he didn't have a lot of faith in her memory to hold that in. She had been out very late the previous night, and he didn't want to make her mad. But maybe if she forgot about the museum, she'd take him to see his dad. Philip didn't have a lot to hope for, but in hopelessness he pressed on, trying to believe he could change the future and make himself a new dawn. When his mother finally awoke, she lazily looked around. She looked more lucid than Philip usually saw. Perhaps she would take him into town. Hey, slugger. How was your night? She said as she smacked her lips. Good. I waited patiently like you wanted. She leaned over and gave him a kiss. Good job, Philip. You've been a good boy. And it's time to reward you. Are you ready to go to the museum? Philip's heart took off and flew. Really? We have enough money to go? I made it all last night. She started their car, and they drove to the museum to see the amazing sight. Philip didn't have a lot to hope for, but in hopelessness he pressed on, trying to believe he could change the future and make himself a new dawn. The Ontario Science Center had just recently opened its doors, and its modern domed architecture stretched from roof to floor. The line outside stretched further as down the street it wound and Philip and his mother sat on the ground. The museum isn't open yet, but we'll wait here until then. Philip couldn't contain himself, so he danced and imagined wise men. He thought of the heroes he read about, Edison and Einstein. He dreamed of becoming like one of those men, a creator prized for his mind. But then he looked over at his mother and saw a man talking to her there. He whispered into her ear and held out money. Then he stroked her hair. Philip read her lips. She said, Not today. And then the man moved on and left. He was thankful his mother thought of him, and not making more money yet. Soon they were let into a museum, and it was the greatest day of his life. His inspiration soared to new heights, and he forgot all of his strife. He dreamt of a brighter future, of a peaceful world of tomorrow. He envisioned his problems melting away and inventing a destroyer of sorrows. Philip didn't have a lot to hope for, but in hopelessness he pressed on, trying to believe he could change the future and make himself a new dawn. Thanks for listening to this episode of Audio Adventures. If your imagination was fed by this story, I pray that you'll consider supporting these stories at joshuadavidling.com support or on Cash App, dollar sign Joshua David Ling. Until next time, keep adventuring.